Hello all. This video will be like a brief overview then of paper two, just like the paper one video. The paper two video is all of your human geography topics. So this video will cover urban issues, change in economic world and resource management. So if we start with the first section you'll see when you open the paper, the first one you'll be greeted with is urban issues and challenges. This is worth roughly 33 marks, so it's worth the most marks then on this paper. So with urban issues and challenges, the first sort of big process you need to understand is exactly what urbanisation is. Now, all urbanisation is, is more people moving into towns and cities. And we're seeing a huge trend worldwide of more people migrating into towns and cities or urban areas. That key fact that you can see here on the screen, I think is pretty interesting. So in 2007, the UN announced that more than 50% of the world's population live in urban areas. And the graph that you can see here sort of proves that or shows us that. So we can see here, look, all my different continents. And I can say, right, well, the average trend across the world as I move here, look, from 1812, whatever it is, to 2020, is that more people now are in these urban areas. So what's causing people then to move into these urban areas? I would say there are two main causes here, and these are the two, coincidentally, you're going to need to know for the exam. So the first big cause then is rural to urban migration. So that's people moving from the countryside into those towns and cities. And that's probably happening because of your push and pull factors. Push factors are things that make you want to leave a place. Pull factors are the things that draw you in. So push factors would be things like natural disasters, drought, lack of employment. They're not particularly good about a place. Whereas pull factors would be the opposite. So the, sort of putting a positive spin on things. So having more jobs, having a better quality of life, perhaps following family members that are already there. The second thing that's causing more urbanisation then is something called natural increase. If you have natural increase, this is where the birth rate of your country exceeds the death rate, i.e. you've got more people being born than you have people dying. But what's going to cause an increase in birth rate? Perhaps things like lack of contraception, or more people of a childbearing age, i.e. younger population. A lower death rate could be things like having a higher life expectancy because there's better living conditions, improved medical care, any of those reasons. Important to note then that you have different types of cities. The one that you need to be really familiar with is this idea of a mega city and what exactly a mega city is. So a mega city would just be an urban area with 10 million people living there. Remember, a millionaire city would be 1 million. World city would be a city that's got financial or worldwide importance. Remember, a city can be a mega city and a world city. Important to note then that more than two thirds of current mega cities are located in NEs and LICs. The biggest growing ones at the moment are in Brazil and Nigeria. So before we go any further then, sort of think about the case studies of this topic, there are four key words I suggest you familiarise yourself with. So integrated transport system, so it's just when we link together different types of public and private transport. Brownfield sites, so these are areas of land that have previously been developed. Greenbelt land is an area of green land, so think about fields that surround a town or a city. And regeneration then is when you invest in reviving an area, perhaps by rebuilding it. So if we think about sustainability at the moment, the idea of something being sustainable means that you can do it again in a year, three years, five years time, etc. So I would suggest here then that we've got four main ways that you can try and generate sustainable urban living. So you might think about water conservation, so perhaps collecting rainwater, educating people on losing less water, energy conservation, so trying to reduce the amount of fossil fuels you're using, so thinking about renewable energy sources, waste recycling, perhaps then using more recycling and trying to generate a bit more awareness of the benefits of recycling, and then last but not least, creating green space. So you might have heard of something called urban greening, which is promoting those green areas within our towns and cities. So if we think about planning them and how this impacts on planning our urban areas, 
with case study we've done thinks about tempo housing now the whole point of tempo housing is trying to cope with lagos's rapidly rising population and trying to better their quality of life remember when we talk about sustainability we're not just thinking about environmental sustainability we're also thinking about economic and social sustainability as well so tempo housing makes homes out of recycled shipping containers they can build these in about seven days. They're 25% cheaper than a conventional home. You can buy them roughly £4,300 or 2 million naira. Plumbed in facilities, so you've got a bathroom and you've got a kitchen. And it's providing jobs in the formal sector. So those are sort of all your benefits. I suppose the downsides to tempo housing, they're still pretty expensive. So you've got to be able to afford that 2 million naira. Some people, the local people, worry about losing the sense of community that they might have from informal housing. There's a bit of a stigma around them. And the issue with using these steel containers is that steel conducts the heat. So they're going to need to be able to cope with the climate and be well insulated. Remember the temperature of Lagos as well, pretty high. So it's likely it's going to be pretty sweltering inside those containers. If we continue with this theme of sustainability then... We've got to think about traffic. We know urban areas are particularly busy places. Well, that creates problems for us in sort of three branches. We've got environmental, economic and social problems. So the big environmental problems is obviously going to be able to do with air pollution. Economic problems makes people late for work. Socially, you might say, well, there's a greater risk perhaps of accidents. There are solutions to this. So you might widen the roads. You might build ring roads and bypasses. You might introduce things like the congestion charge. Think about your case study here of Curitiba. I'll write that one down for you. Curitiba is using that bi-articulated buses. So they take 4,000 passengers a day. One ticket takes you anywhere within the city. They're also using it as part of waste management and the green exchange where people bring their rubbish to the trucks, get it weighed, and they swap it for excess or leftover foods to save it from going to waste. If we then think about your urban change in a major UK city, your example would be London. London being located in South East England. Well, why is London particularly important? It's grown because of trade. You've got the docks that are particularly important. It's the UK's wealthiest, largest capital city renowned for things like education, particularly its universities. But with that brings opportunity and challenge. So I would suggest that your opportunity centre around those three areas you can see I've put here on the screen. So if we start by thinking about Notting Hill, an area that's experienced gentrification, well, it's a particularly popular area of London, house prices have risen massively, but that's also a challenge. In 1950s, it was a huge centre of deprivation, huge race riots. If you think about Crossrail, there's some big benefits there. It's bringing an extra one and a half million people within a 45 minute journey of London. But the downside to that is it's outpricing first time buyers. So therefore people can't afford to buy houses in those areas. Urban greening, sort of protecting our green space. Huge benefit there for wildlife. However, it's costing quite a lot. The Garden Bridge was a strategy that was launched back in 2017 and they cancelled it due to the economic costs. But by that point, the taxpayers had already spent £40 million on it. So it's about weighing it up here. And Where do you sort of sit? Do you think these are particularly good things? Or actually, do you think these challenges far outweigh the opportunities? You might be asked to sort of weigh this up in an eye marker and say, right, for one UK city you've studied, to what extent does opportunity outweigh challenge or vice versa? So just make sure you can evaluate these points. London Docklands then, it's particularly important just to recap that. London Docklands is your example of regeneration. The LDDC stands for London Docklands Development Corporation. So this was set up in 1981 to improve the rundown docks. The docks has gone into decline, so the LDDC came in, demolished the area and rebuilt. So they built some housing, they built these brand new high-rise office buildings, if you've ever watched The Apprentice, opening credits, that whole area, that's London Docklands. Well, why is that particularly good? They've planted loads of trees. They've brought in 2,700 new businesses. They've spent huge amounts on education. Actually, 
Does it benefit the local people that were there before? So I'd say the big downside or criticism to London Docklands is it outpriced the people that used to live there. Those people can no longer afford their homes there. There's a huge loss in terms of sense of community and the new jobs and things they put in. Well, they had a different skill set to the people that are already there. So the people who used to live there effectively aren't qualified to do those new jobs that they were replaced with. If we compare this then to your major change in an NEE city, so your example would be Lagos. Well, some background to Lagos, it's Nigeria's largest city, huge amounts of growth. They've got large amounts of natural increase there, so more people being born than they have dying. They've also got huge amounts of rural to urban migration, so just about half a million people moving into Lagos each year. So about 60% of these people are living in formal housing, so Makoko. Hence why we talked about tempo housing and why that needed to be really good. Again, electricity is only available illegally. They've got one primary school. 37% of the population are illiterate. They're living on less than a pound a day. So again, for that nine marker, you might be asked to weigh up opportunity versus challenge. So I think there are some big benefits here in the fact that 68% are getting secondary education. Economically, they've got a renowned international airport pretty good rail and road links environmentally they've got this opportunity now to build sustainability they've got again recycling of waste really good program there big challenges though well actually what's happening in terms of pollution and why we say right, pollution is a pretty big word in the exam you're going to have to break that down are we thinking about water air land pollution and you'll see that these challenges over here i've done exactly that okay so again, I'm thinking about, right, can I weigh up both sides of the argument if this is to appear as a nine marker? Moving on then, section two of the paper will be all about economic world. Economic world has got lots of terminology to it, but if you wrap your head around it, it should be absolutely fine. So I suppose the first thing that's important to say with economic world is you need to understand what development is. And development just means improving living standards through better access to things like resources. OK, and that can happen on three branches that could be economic, social or environmental. Again, I've put a little example here on the screen about what I mean for each of those three. Again, then you're thinking about variations in level of development around the world. We group countries according to three brackets, so LICs, NEs and HICs. Again, make sure you understand the difference between these three. Important point to note is that they will include definitions of each of these three on the front cover of the paper. So if you do forget during the exam, you can always flick back and have a little look. This map over here shows you where you're finding your HICs, your NEs and your LICs around the world. Right, if we think about how we measure development then, we have what we call economic indicators and social indicators. Economic indicators are mainly focused on thinking about money. So if I want to measure that, I might look at the employment type, so what jobs people are doing. I might look at GDP, so the value of goods and services. I might also look at the income of the average person. If I'm thinking about sort of social development, I might look at infant mortality, so the number of babies that die. I might think about literacy rate, so those people that can read and write. I might also take into account life expectancy. The mixed indicator would be HDI, which stands for Human Development Index. And to calculate that, it uses both social indicators and economic indicators. So it looks at life expectancy, income, and the amount of education a person has had to then rank countries from most to least development. You might argue that HDI here is the most reliable measure because it's using both social and economic measures. The demographic transition model plots a country's development across five stages. It's important you understand that there are three line graphs in one here and that you know the change that's happening over time. I've summed up each of these five stages here. Essentially, at stage one, we've got high death rate, high birth rate, and the population is sort of at a steady level. Groups that I'd find in stage one would be like my tribes, so perhaps my Amazonian tribes at stage two. The birth rate then starts to drop off a little bit. Death rate remains pretty high. Example here would be Kenya. In stage three, I've got a rapidly falling death rate. 
I've got a pretty low birth rate, but my population now is pretty high. So if I look at my graph, this is stage three here. So countries like India, so I think NEs here. In stage four, again, low death rate, low birth rate. Population now is pretty steady. So if I check my graph here, so that would be us in the UK. And in stage five, really, we've got a falling death rate, a low birth rate, and negative population growth. So countries there would be Japan. So if I think about development again, I can get uneven development. Okay, that means well, it's not the same everywhere. Development can be uneven because of a variety of factors. These again are grouped into physical and human factors. You might be asked for six marks in the exam to weigh up whether you think physical or human factors affect uneven development, perhaps which one's most significant. If I'm thinking about sort of physical factors, I might think about a country's access to natural resources, so things like oil, safe water. I might think about their climate and how that's going to limit their development. Well, extremes in climate might affect things like farming, for example, attracting tourists, natural hazards. Well, they just bring benefits, so perhaps particularly good soil. But again, if you have frequent hazards, i.e. frequent volcanic eruptions, it's going to limit your development. And the location. So if you're landlocked, you might find it quite difficult to trade, for example. If I compare that to my human factors, well, aid, again, that might bring some pretty key benefits in terms of developing infrastructure faster. It might improve services. But again, if you become reliant on aid, then establishing trade links are pretty difficult. Trade we've already talked about, if you're landlocked, can be quite difficult. Healthcare, so lack of clean water might limit development. Education, again, do you have a skilled workforce that would enable you to develop? Politics, so things like corruption. Again, the stability of government can affect a country's ability to trade. And history, so colonialism. Again, the big issue with colonisation is that extraction of raw materials can leave countries worse off so if we think about the consequences then of uneven development i would sort of suggest that there are three main ones here that you may all wish to weigh up so you might say right wealth here could be a factor Healthcare, so better health care means that people in developed countries live longer so therefore increases life expectancy migration if you've got a neighboring country that's more secure with its resources it's going to attract people to move isn't it that's going to become a pull factor the development gap then is the gap between the world's richest country and the poorest country and there are ways in which we can go about trying to reduce that gap there are six here in total that i've popped on the screen again you might be asked to evaluate for nine marks solutions to reducing the development gap so I would suggest that you perhaps commit three of these to memory, know what it is, a positive and a negative for each one would be particularly useful. The microfinance loans, again, gives people small grants. Well, that's good because people can set up their own businesses. But again, does it work at a larger scale? Aid given by one country to another. Well, that's pretty good if you can invest it. But if you've got a corrupt government, that cash might be wasted. FDI, so foreign direct investment. When one country buys property in another, again, better access perhaps to finance. Investment might come with strings attached. Debt relief is when it's cancelled or written off. So it means more money now can be spent on development, but local people might not always get a say. Fair trade, so giving farmers a fair price for their produce. Again, particularly good if it's paid fairly. It can help develop things like schools but only a tiny proportion of that money actually reaches the producer. And technology, so tools, machines, affordable equipment. Why is that good? Well, renewable energy is less expensive. However, it does require a high initial investment. If we continue thinking about case studies then, in terms of reducing development gap, the big one you've got is tourism in Tunisia. Why is that particularly good? Well, they're benefiting from the multiplier effect. More jobs in tourism means more money has been spent on shops and other services, huge investment in infrastructure. The bit that's most important here is the bottom few bullet points where it says how has it helped to reduce the development gap. Incomes have quadrupled, literacy rates have increased to 79%, exposure to other cultures, again it's challenged attitudes towards girls, so school is now compulsory for women and girls. 
your case study then for economic development would be Nigeria. Again, we've already talked about the location and importance, so I won't recap that one again. But think about the influences upon Nigeria's development here. Again, this is categorised into sort of four brackets. So political, social, cultural and industrial. Again, just check, can you do two or three bullet points from each of those sections? If you need to pause it here to just check that, please do. The role of TNCs then. So again, let's highlight this one because this is important. Shell Oil have played a huge role in its economy. They've invested loads, employing loads of people. The downside to this one is we're seeing a leakage of profits. So the money perhaps is not always being reinvested back into Nigeria. Lots of oil spills have damaged the natural environment. Again, you'll see that we've linked that to these environmental impacts below. Think also about aid and debt relief. Again, they're receiving quite a lot of aid each year. Groups like Action Aid, improved health centres, etc. But still, some aid is failing to reach people who need it the most due to corruption. Again, you might be asked to evaluate the changing relationships within an NAE that you've studied. If we then sort of flip the coin and we think about HIC, so if we think about the UK, again, make sure you know exactly where the UK is located. Sounds really basic, but questions like that trip people up. There was a question a couple of years ago that asks you to describe the location of an important city within the UK. You'll be surprised the amount of people who couldn't answer it, so just check that you can now. Think about what's driving economic change. This move towards a post-industrial economy. So now having more people in sort of quaternary industry. Think about why that's happening. We're exporting more. We're importing far more than we were before because it's cheaper. Development of science parks. Again, to support that quaternary industry. Has access then to transport routes, highly educated workers. The UK car industry, your example being Jaguar Land Rover. Think about why that's particularly important in sort of bridging the north-south divide. I've done a separate video on that, which I'll link here if I remember. Change again to the rural landscape. Think about what's happening now. We're building on far more green belt land than we were before. Why is that happening? What well, urbanisation is happening at a much faster rate for us? We're seeing lots of urban sprawl. So towns growing outwards. We've got to improve transport. So we're investing loads. There are sort of four main ways that we're doing that. They're all in that lovely little paragraph here. You've got your brand new HS2. 50 billion has been spent on that. The third runway at Heathrow. The brand new ports. Again, what's that going to help to do? Just check you can evaluate those. Why are those strategies particularly good? But also what are the limitations or drawbacks? Think also here about the north-south divide. So the idea that the south is richer and the north is poorer. Again, can you explain the strategies used to reduce that? HS2 here would be a particularly good one to draw on in the exam. And so the final section then of paper two takes us to resource management. In resource management, remember you've got the generic section on resources first, where you'll be asked to sort of do all the questions on food, water and energy, so that would be question three, before you would then choose your optional one. You're going to choose to do question five on water, because that's what we've studied. So resources are things that we require for life. Again, that's going to fall under food, water and energy. Without enough food, we become malnourished. We need clean and safe water. We need also light and heat, they're basic human needs. Demand at the moment is currently outstripping supply. If we've got the population keep going up and up and up, we've only got a certain amount of resources. The challenge for us comes down to how we're going to meet the needs of the population. Currently then, global population is about 7.3 billion. Again, if we've got this continued growth, what are we doing to meet those needs? Think about economic development and how you can link the two together here. LICs and NEEs want similar lifestyles to HSEs. They're going to consume far more resources now. This resource reliance graph sort of illustrates that particularly well. If we think about food in the UK, what are we sort of doing there? The impacts of this demand, well, we're supporting far more people and providing them an income. Taxes from farmers contribute to local services. There's less land, I suppose, as a negative for locals to grow their own food. Farmers are exposed to chemicals. 
agribusiness is particularly important to make sure you understand that. So farming being treated like a large industrial business is what we mean by agribusiness. Why is that good? Intensive farming produces more food, increases farm's efficiency. The negative is only employs a small amount of workers. We're using more chemicals, again pesticides, impacts hugely on our wildlife. Energy in the UK and the changing energy mix. So 75% of the UK's oil and gas has been used up. Coal consumption's declining. The UK is becoming reliant on imported energy. The majority of it is coming from fossil fuels. Again, the government's trying to get more and more renewable sources. Think about, again, the significance of renewables. Can you evaluate them? Perhaps lower carbon emissions, brand new targets, renewable sources. Why are they particularly important? Think about the negatives as well, though. Talk here, I would, in the exam about things like fracking and the impact on local people. New plants provide job opportunities, but again, you've got issues with safety and wildlife and displacement of people and water. Moving swiftly on then to water in the UK. Again, households are going to continue to demand water. As technology improves and more people have got things like dishwashers and washing machines, they're going to consume more water. This is giving us an issue then with water stress in the UK, which is what this graph or map is showing you here. Again, think about where have we got an abundance of water, where have we also got water stress. Okay, we've got lots of water in the north, but not enough in the south. Well, why is that? Most of our cities are in the south, quite rural and remote locations in the north. So again, we've got to use transfer schemes to pump that water from the north to the south in order to meet people's needs. This bit here then, where it says option two water, this is the stuff you'll need to answer question five. If you've got water security, you've got enough people then that have got access to clean water supply. I sort of group these ideas here into human and physical. Think about what's going to impact on that. Well, we might cause pollution. Poverty prevents people from affording water over abstraction if we're taking too much. Physical then, or the climate impacts on the amount of water we've got. Geology again impacts our accessibility to water too. Water insecurity again provides huge impacts. So it impacts on our food production if we don't have enough water to irrigate crops. Industrial output as well because we do need water in order to run our factories. Impacts on diseases. We can have then conflict if we've got a shortage of water. There are ways in which we can increase the water supply. You'll see that I've sort of annotated on four here. But water diversion, so again, so changing the route that water takes. Dams and reservoirs to build up a storage of water. Water transfer, so we've talked about that already, but moving perhaps water from the north to the south. Desalination, so taking out salt from seawater to produce fresh drinking water. The big thing here, I suppose, and the big challenge for our population now is increasing that sustainable water supply. And there are ways in which we can do that, having conservation schemes, groundwater management, recycling water and using grey water as well. So the final thing to say then is that you've got two case studies as part of resource management should you choose to answer these questions. So you've got the North-South Water Divide project. You've also got the Kenyan sand dams as well. So the SNWTP, South North Water Transfer Project. This project here then wants to transfer 44.8 billion cubic litres of water every year then from the south to north of China. It's going to cost, let's highlight that one, that's important, $62 billion via three planned routes. Again, what they've done so far is they've built the eastern and central routes. 20 million people in the north of country need better access to water, which is why they need this. So advantages wise, it's going to provide a reliable water supply. It's going to help industry to develop. It's also going to be used to irrigate farmland so they can grow more crops. However, if you look at this list, I think there's quite a few disadvantages to this. They've got to flood land in order to build it. They're starting to damage natural ecosystems, which are pretty fragile. Raising the dam has flooded land already, forced 345,000 people to move. The cost is pretty high for consumers. The project's only benefiting, wow, urban areas. That's important, I think. 
So again, just check you can weigh them up. Highly likely that you're going to be asked for one of the larger questions to weigh up the success of one of these schemes. So can you talk about advantages and disadvantages of the SNWTP? And finally then is Kenyan Sandams. So why are these needed? Well, we know Kenya's an LIC, it's got a hot, dry climate, so it needs that sustainable water supply all year round. So the whole point of having these then is that you build this one metre high dam, the sand gets deposited behind it because river speed decreases, the water gets trapped then. In the dry season, the sand protects the water so it doesn't evaporate, and when the river dries up, wells can be dug down to retrieve the water that's underneath. So why is this particularly sustainable? Well, it uses local materials, the local workforce are also employed. The dam can be raised each year, so you can continue to use it into the future. And it's made from natural materials, so you've got little to no damage to the environment. Again, with these, just check you understand exactly how they work and why they would be considered sustainable. And that is everything for paper two. So again, I'd encourage you now just to check back through if there's anything there that you're unsure of. And just make sure for anything I've said, can you evaluate that you can do at least two positives and two negatives because it's highly likely those will be the higher tariff marked questions in the exam. Very best of luck.